chance to <laughs> test out your skills talking about the importance of gerrymandering and why you decided to come here today. All right, so before we go any further, I wanted to highlight to people that social media is an important way to get the word out about redistricting reform. So if you're wanting to take pictures or you're wanting to tweet, um, please feel free to do that. Um, I found the restroom, but I'm not a good guide on that because they're too bad. They're too. Is it? Is it this one right here? Okay, up the stairs and to the left. I'm from out of town. Uh, oh, uh, at any rate, um, the, the lovely Susan Alcorn's in the back. She will guide you to the restroom. She'll do the Vanna White thing, so you can find that. Um, there's coffee that's over there. You will notice, notice there's a little area for donation because, of course, we need all the people power we can get, but you always need the money. Um, and in this case, um, the money goes for things like um, handouts. It goes, it goes for all sorts of different things at this point. To begin the collection, it actually costs about $50,000 to do the first printing of petitions. I know, isn't that insane? It's insane. And it has to do, if you need 600,000 signatures, Think about, like, and, and yes, there may be 50 some in a booklet, but at the end of the day, lots of us will get 15, right? And that's the way, that's good. Many hands make light work. Hello, my friend. Yes, who do you make a check out to, Common Cause? So you can make a check out to Fair, uh, uh, Fair Congressional Districts for Ohio, or you can write it to the league and put Fair Districts in your little memo section. Or you can give us cash, That's that works too. So it's Fair Congressional Districts for Ohio. That's the name of the actual campaign. And then you can also give to the League of Women Voters and of highlight Ohio. that it's of Ohio and highlight that it's for fair districts. All right, so. Would you, you, have a, to, would you let me collect those? Oh, so, so introduce yourself. I, I, I'm Mary Ann Barnes. I'm with the local league, the League of Women Voters of Greater Cleveland. And so if you want to give me your donations, I will make sure that Catherine gets them before she leaves today. And there's also a little uh, stand-up display back there that also tells you uh, how, how to give it to the League of Women Voters. I think the Fair Districts has been... Uh, so that explains yeah, you, you, that explains to you how to give to, uh, to the Fair Districts campaign through the League of Women Voters of Ohio. I think the Fair Districts... Account is just set up That's correct. Yeah. So it is, so it takes a little while, strangely enough, to get a pack going. I know at the national level they make it seem like a super easy, but it took a little while to get moving. Um, now, because of you, um, I wasn't even thinking about campaign contributions this morning. And so as as we think about doing, all of us bring different skills and different ideas. And so one of the things that makes these trainings really useful is if we all pitch in and have conversations. And Susan in the back wants to know when we're going to get a break. <laughs> so do not worry. Any of you who are like, wait a second, I had a bunch of coffee. I need a little bit of a, I need a chance to say hello to everybody. We'll take a little break in the middle just to give you a chance to, to visit. Because you came out on a Saturday morning where you could be out in the sunshine, right? All right. So we always need to start with, there are a lot of people that are really not familiar with why we redistrict. And so it's important at some point to, you may not just do a nod to it, it depends <coughs> on, on who's, a, you know, how well you think people are versed. But it's really useful to remind people that while well, we redraw the district lines following the census. And we do that for congressional districts because each state is apportioned based on the state population, right? And so it's important to remember, or I mean, people, you know, this is something that happens every 10 years, and it's because the census happens every 10 years, and because we get X number of congressional districts. Now, many of you will remember when we had 19 or 18, you know, we're down to 16, it's possible we'll be down to 15. The thing that's kind of interesting to you to think about is, you know, yes, population may have gone down, but we've basically stayed steady, but other states have gone up. So it's all based on uh, on the state, you know, on uh, how many people we have. Now, how many people have heard one person, one vote? <laughs> oh yeah, you're a savvy audience. One yeah. person, one vote. Now that goes back to a decision, uh, Baker versus Carr, uh, in the early 60s, it was 1962, when the US uh, Supreme Court said that in fact, those districts need to be very equivalent 
in population. That, you know, it's not fair to have a district that is, is just significantly larger than another. And that really came about because there was this case um, in Tennessee, and Ohio did the same thing, where they kept the same districts for the state legislature for 60 years. And you could imagine, they were based on counties, and you could imagine the problems, right? So it turned out in, in, uh, in Tennessee at that point, what happened is one district, like in the city, it would take 23 people for the one person's vote in the country. And so one of the basic rules of all of this is that the population should be basically equal. All right, so the state legislature draws the congressional districts right now. It's the state legislature that does it. I think the thing that is very important to remember is that even though the state legislature actually draws those district lines, it's not like <laughs> it's not like the state legislators are there with their, their computer and they're having conversations about how we're going to do this. This is handed off to consultants. And in 2011, um, we know this from public records, so we should be really glad that we are a state that has good public records. We know that when they drew these district lines, they were drawn by consultants. One, a woman named Heather Mann, now Heather Mann Blessing, um, and, and Ray DeRossi. Now, Heather Mann was the lead counsel to the Speaker of the House at that time. She literally went off the payroll for a period of months to draw these district lines in a hotel room, <coughs> 500 feet from the State House. And they called the hotel room the bunker. Now these are the kind of details, maybe you're, you know, maybe you won't remember, you maybe you will not include in your discussion, but th the stories are actually very important. That idea that they hand this off to political consultants to draw these district lines, and they draw them for a variety of different reasons, but the most important reason has to do with gerrymandering. So now when we think about gerrymandering, I'm gonna draw us back to this as the original gerrymandering. Now in 1812, there was a guy named Elbridge Gary. Not Jerry, but Gary, Elbridge Gary. Now Elbridge is somebody who signed the Declaration of Independence. He was somebody who promoted the Bill of Rights. He was a VP under James Madison. And yet, when he was governor of Massachusetts, he put party over people. And that set the stage for years and years of putting party over people. And this is a crazy district. This is Massachusetts. Anyone here from Massachusetts? Hello, this is a crazy, you'll notice that it isn't exactly quite right. It's been flipped a little. Um, but, but the uh, Boston Gazette editors looked at this and they saw, you know, they saw a salamander and then they, you know, jazz the salamander up the way that political cartoonists do. And that's where it becomes, you got Gary or Jerry, salamander, gerrymander. So think of it like, Brangelina, right? <laughs> and much like Brangelina, we want to separate, right? We want to end this. Um, and what's really sad about this is these have real consequences. And Ohio is one of the states that's very badly gerrymandered. Now, lots, there are lots of good examples. There's like some serious craziness in North Carolina, for example. Um, I, I was going to say Maryland. Um, which is a state that it was gerrymandered by Democrats. So the thing to remember is whoever has the power of drawing those district lines, it is a winner-take-all system. Democrats do it, Republicans do it, and it's not good for voters. It's just not, it's simply not good for voters. Now we have a good sense that we're gerrymandered because we are a swing state, right? We are the swingingest of swing states, right? I mean, everybody comes here, you know, when it's presidential years. We know that we are a battleground state. And yet, they manage to rig these districts to manipulate elections. And that's why we have a sense of the problem. Now, in 2011, the map makers, because we got those public records, we were able to look at them. This chart, if all you see is red and blue, that's, that is not a problem. But what's important here is this line right here, the party projected to win. Now the party that is projected to win was projected by the map makers. And as you look at this, they created Democratic districts, they created Republican districts, and Republicans won every single time in Republican districts. 
Democrats won every single time and Democrats did too. Now, when we look at this, we can see that one party is marginalized, right? You can see it, but as, as bad as that is and how irritating as that might be, it is also really not good for voters because, of course, this leads to uncompetitive elections, right? <coughs> the average uh, the average spread, basically, you know how 5%, like five points is like really competitive? The average in 2016 was 36 points. Whoa. Do you remember when the City Club of Cleveland said they were considering not actually having debates, congressional debates, because they just, you know, it's like, it's so uncompetitive. So in other words, so uncompetitive, not just that it affects elections and who wins the elections, but so uncompetitive, it's leading to not having a debate or an exploration of ideas. The communities aren't having that opportunity to talk about what different policies there might actually be. I did see a hand. Anybody? All right, now, some of you might say, okay, I just looked at this. I can see why the Democrats care. Why do the Republicans care? Well, my friends, all of us care about democracy. All of us care about elections. All of us deserve to actually have our vote be meaningful. Democrats, Republicans, independents, this is not a left or right issue. It is a party issue in that the party in power can take advantage. But it isn't only comes down to us. Gerrymandering is a violation of the will of the people. It violates our right to actually engage in a robust vote. It actually makes it so we're not even having robust debate. All right, so I bet you all are familiar with this. This is probably what drew you in here. <coughs> uh, and so I'm going to just show you some examples of, I'm sure you've heard the phrase, packing and cracking. <coughs> So sometimes people are like, what is packing and cooking? I know there's something going on there. Okay, so uh, an example of packing would be here. I don't have a pointer at all. Um, it would be right here. This is third congressional district where they smoosh all the Democrats together as hard as they can. And you have like a Rorschach ink blot, right? <laughs> now one of the fun stories on this one is that um, they scoop out a section. It's right there. They scoop out a section of downtown Columbus so that the 15th Congressional District is able to pick up nationwide insurance. <laughs> oh yeah, okay, but the 15th is uh, Steve Stivers and it gives him a corporate citizen. So sometimes they move these districts for those kind of reasons. Um, there's a guy named Jim Renacy who's running for governor. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. They actually moved, um, moved district lines so that he was able to get the Timken Peninsula. Pick that up, right? Okay, who here has heard of Timken? Yes. So uh, Jane Timken is now uh, is the chair of the Republican Party at this point. Yes, hello. Hi, I had a question. What's a corporate citizen? What did that, what did uh, you that? Well, I said that a bit tongue in cheek. Okay, well then that's okay. I did, I, I said it completely tongue in cheek. Um, it, it was a way to pick up donors. Oh, okay. It was a way to pick up donors because of course you're not actually picking up people. In the, I was gonna say, I was like, wait. Draw the district goal, lines right? for people, but you can actually move those lines based on other interests than just party. You can do it because you want to pick up some donors. Now, most of you are really familiar with uh, the district that starts in Toledo, Lucas County, it's at the very top. Um, you, uh, I always describe this as the one that there's like more water than there's actual district. So you start like in Lucas County, you start in Toledo, and uh, it's yellow along the way, and it, it jumps over Sandusky County with a bridge, and it works its way all over to Cuyahoga County. So it's got Marcy Captors House at one end, Dennis and Kucinich is at the other. And this is a way to put two Democrats together and make it one district. So one person remains standing. All right. Oh, sure. about, about the map. Okay, I'm gonna go back. So the one in the upper left and then the one along the river along the uh, eastern side, are those truly considered gerrymandered or is that what something like what it should look like? Okay, so because the blue one's clearly gerrymandered. Renacy and Captor clearly gerrymandered, but what does it look like when they're not? Okay, so you are a perfect person for the next section. Oh, awesome. Which is, I know, all right, so you are, you are absolutely perfect. Because for many of us, I know we're in the house of the Lord, so I will say this quietly. Lots of words. It's important to realize that for many of us, we look at gerrymandering as
because when you see it and it looks hinky, it's like porn, right? You know porn's porn when you see it, right? You're like, oh, okay. You know, you know, you know porn's when you, porn when you see it. It's the same thing with these ugly districts. But the problem is, is the ugly is as ugly does. And so yes, this is definitely more compact. Um, I would say definitely as you look at that district, that actually makes much more sense. But once again, if you look at the whole of the state, the districts were drawn to heavily favor one party over the other, and in fact end up cementing incumbents of both parties, making it more difficult to hold people accountable, right? If you can't, if you can't actually vote them out in November, how do you hold them accountable? Anyone in this room participated in town halls or tried to get a town hall? Any troubles up here? <laughs> yeah. 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 Hey, Joyce won't come. So I, I think when, yeah, when you start to think about the very real application of where gerrymandering hits the road, it isn't that just that they're ugly, it's that in fact you have that difficulty of holding these folks accountable. So they, at, they yes? Won't, they won't look the same in terms of geographical size, even if they're not gerrymandered because you need to do them by population size. Correct. Right? Absolutely. Absolutely. Now, the other thing to remember is this. How many of you were like, okay, so I've just listened to this, and that clearly there's a problem. Why haven't they sorted us out in the courts, right? How is this possibly constitutional? Like, I just don't even get it. And that comes back to your question, which your question was about, well, is that one gerrymandered just by looking at it? And it turns out that the courts have, have had cases where they said, okay, absolutely equal population, you know, a little margin, but you know, you know, the population is very important. They said you can't do racial gerrymanders, you can't, you know, you can't marginalize communities, that's not appropriate. But they have nev they've never exactly said what gerrymandering is, because they can't, they never just have come up with a gerrymander standard. Now there is a case, um, it's a Whitford v. Gill. I was a total nerd. I got to meet Bill Whitford and pick his brain. So it's just fun to think about, you know, the people that, that decide they're going to take this to the Supreme Court. Um, so Whitford v. Gill is a case in which um, they have a partisan gerrymander like we do. Uh, this is in Wisconsin. And um, their argument is that it is not equal protection under the 14th Amendment. Any lawyers in here who want to help? Okay, <laughs> you chime in, okay. if, if, if need be. But the idea is equal protection means that all voters should be treated the same. But if you were in fact treating Democratic voters differently than you're treating Republican voters, do you in fact have equal protection? No, of course not. So then the other part of it, <coughs> talking too loud too early in the morning, the other part of it that's kind of interesting is to think about that, that whole notion of like, well, what is gerrymandering? So Bill Whitford got together with this guy named Nick Stephanopoulos. Did anybody see the John Oliver special? Okay. For uh, anyone in this room, it's completely hilarious, but once again, not necessarily safe for work. Just to, <laughs> just to you know, let you know. <laughs> not necessarily safe for work. Um, so Nick Stephanopoulos is married to Ruth Greenwood, who was the person that was mentioned that would mention the wedding cake and their gerrymandered wedding cake? Okay, total side note. Um, total side note. But what is interesting about this is Nick Stephanopoulos is a uh, constitutional scholar. He's in Chicago, and he became interested in the idea of using math to prove, in fact, that there is a gerrymander. And so, so a good simple example would be, let's say we're a 50-50-ish state. Maybe we're 53-47, maybe it's a little bit different, but let's just say we're a 50-50 state. 75% of our representation is Republican. So you've got a 25 difference. And, you could more, and so as opposed to just looking at the districts, you could actually use math to prove it. So that's working its way to the US, the US Supreme Court, and that will make an enormous difference across the country. But when you, if if it works, if it works, you're it works in the Supreme Court. So I don't think you wouldn't just that they're using math to prove that it's gerrymandered, but that they finally come up with a mathematical model to fix it. So uh, or to give guidance to to give guidance. So I think it's important to realize that they have not come up with what's called a gerrymander standard. Um, hopefully, this will establish it. As I'm also cynical about that. If yeah. 
The other part of it is that whole notion of, okay, we could, in fact, hope that this could come together, but it's important to, it's important to realize, in fact, that sometimes um, you have to wait a really long time. Okay, so they set, just like Ohio, it was 2011 when these maps were created. It is 2017, and they're likely not to get a decision until 2018, right? Meaning, you need to have good rules in place at the head of the game, even if the courts are on your side. Because none of us want to wait, you know, nearly a decade to actually correct the craziness that might happen, right? All right, um, so I think I covered everything that you might actually need. Who here is ready to talk about our proposal? <laughs> Woo -hoo. Woo -hoo. All right. So, um, for, yes, please. Uh, are, is this PowerPoint going to be available to us? Oh, okay. So one of the things that I have done is put together a folder. It's a Google folder, and it has, you know, handouts. It has a de more detailed explanation of a lot of the things I've gone through. It includes a PowerPoint, and it also includes some webinars that I've done so that you can, if you need just a, you know, a reminder or you want a little bit more information. The other thing is that you can always, you know, you can always ask. I mean, so if there's something that you're like, I just don't quite get this part, you just, you know, just let, you know, send an email. We will, we will get back to you as soon as we can. Now, you should know it's always going to take a day or two, but this is a good example. Uh, today, I'm in Cleveland. On Monday, I'm in Mercer County. Do you all know where Mercer County is? Yeah. Middle of nowhere on, on the Indiana border between Toledo and Cincinnati. <laughs> and then, <laughs> all right, I know. And then, and then uh, I'm, off to, I'm off to Toledo for Thursday, and Saturday is Dayton. So what can often happen is, even though I'm trying to be on top of things, um, other people are doing the same kind of thing that I'm doing. So um, just be patient with us. We're very sorry. Hello. Are you coming back here ever? Because there are a whole bunch of people that would like to get trained that couldn't get in because it was closed down. It is my plan to come back. First of all, I have to get to my kids' graduation at the end of the month. Um, but but we'll, we'll, do, we'll hope to do something in June and July. So that, that was, and I realize July is not necessarily the best for everybody. Yes. How do we access the Google folder? Right. So one of the things, that, one of the reasons you, we asked you to sign in was to get your emails. We also collected it when you signed up. So we will send you the material after this. Do not expect it until Monday. Okay. So it will not come to you until Monday. Um, and then the other thing is, you know, if you think there's something that we really should have in there, you know, just you know, send, send a no because you know one of uh, one of the things that I think is really exciting about this kind of grassroots effort is that we really can come up with a really collaborative approach to talking about this. And many of us, you know, what I want people to walk away with is, I'm going to talk about gerrymandering in a completely different way than you are. And each of us need to feel kind of comfortable about what are the basic facts. But, you know, for many of us, if it's about petitions, really all you need is, hey, do you care about fair elections? Right? Come over and sign this. because. You know, if we don't have fair districts, we don't have fair elections. We did this last year, you know, or I guess 15. We did this in 15. Sorry, it's all blending. Um, we did this in 15, um, and we did the state house. Now it's time for Congress, which leads back to our slide, which is one of the questions that many of you are going to get is, didn't we do this already? So polling indicates that a third of the people that you are going to run into are going to say, well, wait a second. Didn't we do this already? Now it may not be exactly that amount because you know you do a sample, but a third of the people are likely to be confused and think that you did this already. So what we do know is that issue one of 2015 won by more than 71 percent of the vote. Issue one of 2015 won in all 88 counties. And when you think about that, this should have been a mandate to our state legislature. <laughs> the Ohio General Assembly should have said, well, wait a second, clearly voters really want to have fair districts and fair elections. Now, you think I'm naive, don't you? <laughs> yes, hello. I'm just curious, I get a lot of questions about the 2012 attempt at this um, you know, legislation, this, this ballot yes, yes. It failed in 2012. Why? And what's different? What's different now? <laughs> okay, so so um, this the tale of gerrymandering and the tale of redistricting reform is long and fairly troubled. 
Um, okay, so who here in this room started working on redistricting reform in 1981? <laughs> Okay. <laughs> okay. Stand up and take them out. Okay. Yes. Linda, did you too? Yes. Okay. So, um, there is a timeline. There is a time. Oh, thank you. I appreciate that. So uh, it's good to have her. So can you stand up and tell people? Yeah. It's it has. It's not the one that's updated, which is actually on the album video website. But we do have copies of the previous one, which goes up to before 2015. But it's back there, and it's a timeline of uh, efforts for redistricting reform going back. Mike, do you years. want to do a Vanna White? Yeah. yeah there, you go. there it is. Like <laughs> 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 oh, Part of it was this is a very complex issue that people don't understand. And how you present it is, is very important. And at that point, when the league was, you know, really, really working on this, and people just, it was very hard for them to understand it. And, and then when we got past that, when, when, when we had the snake on the lake, when we, when we were doing that, that was easy to explain. <laughs> and people understood that immediately and realized what was going on. So we need to use that. So did everybody have a chance to hear what she was no. saying? No. Okay, so what she said is in 2012, it was very complicated, the, the proposal was very complicated, but she found that if you were able to show the map, you were able to explain it. Because let's face it, those shenanigans are pretty obvious when you look at the map. I used the snake in the lake, and Dennis Kucinich and, Matt and Marcy Kapter. People remember that. So people remember that snake on the lake, but who wants to call it the mistake on the lake? <laughs> uh, I, I, you know, one of the things that, that we have done over a period of time is, okay, so we had a redistricting reform measure, I'll get you a redistricting reform measure in, that was on the ballot in 1981, 2005, 2012, and 2015. In other words, it has been very hard to actually fix redistricting, right? So in, in, 19, in 1981, the chair of the committee that um, was proposing redistricting reform fo focused on compactness was a guy named Bob Bennett. Does that name mean anything? Uh, okay, so he was the chair of the Republican Party after this. He, at this point, he was, a, he was a young whippersnapper in 1981. Um, but the thing to remember is that at that point, Vern Reif was around, the Democrats were in power, and the Republicans wanted to improve the system. They wanted fair districts. And the tale of redistricting reform is a tale of one party being all about it, because they're out of power, and the other party being like, oh no, the, the, I'm sorry, we won the elections. We are gonna take advantage of whatever tools we have. Um, the other thing to remember is there were time periods, like in 2009, 2010, when I thought we were actually going to get something passed legislatively, um, both the Democrats and the Republicans thought they were going to win. Oh, <laughs> and, and so it actually made it hard with both the Republicans and Democrats. The thing that's so important about this is, you know, wanting fair districts is good for all voters, and all voters should actually want to have accountability, have their community represented, but it is always a struggle, it's always a struggle for party leaders to give up what has been a tool. Now, Elbridge Geary may have wanted to do district lines that were like the snake on the lake, but he didn't have a computer. <laughs> so one of the things that's really important here is that redistricting has gotten much more precise because of map making. My friend Chris Glassburn, do you want to throw something out about map making? Oh, sure. Uh, hello, everyone. I'm uh, one of the gerrymanderers that you're trying to take <laughs> over. Uh, I wish you success uh, in that endeavor. If you don't do it, I will gerrymander the state. Uh, <laughs> that said, uh, in 2000 and earlier, people like myself who draw these maps we had confidence that like on a city level that maybe Parm is going to lean Democratic and we know Shaker is going to be Democratic. But when we were drawing these districts, we didn't have the data, we didn't have 
quite frankly, the technology to really get much lower than a city level or in large cities, maybe a ward level, uh, to draw the district. So the advantage, we could advantage our party was maybe 10%. So like if we get 50% of the vote, we'll get 60% of the seats. In 2010, we had, a li we had more computer technology to do the drawing, but we still didn't quite have the data behind it. You know, all of you, you know, Obama with Vote Builder for those who are on the Democratic side, um, started gathering personal data. We had some information, and so it was on more like the precinct level, which is about a thousand people, where we had confidence this precinct's going to go Democratic, this precinct's going to be 50 50, this precinct's going to be Republican. And so we could draw and advantage our party closer to 20%. The problem is, is that in this next cycle, I'm going to be able to draw around all your houses individually. I know which households are Democratic, I know which ones are Republican, I know which ones vote. I know which ones are union members. I know which ones have this magazine. I know your income level. I know pretty much everything about you, as does every commercial retailer in this country. So the advantage that I can get out of this is more like 30 to 35% in this next cycle. So if my party gets 40% of the vote, so again, I, I want to be as nonpartisan as I can, but say, that, say the Republican Party has a 40% success rate with you know, Trump's approval rating right around there. They could still get 75% of the seats with 40% of the vote. This, is, this, is, this starts verging into the territory where you're saying, is this still democracy? No, it's not. So this is, I mean, it, 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 we've all known that redistricting and gerrymandering, you know, gerrymandering is bad. But it is quantifiably much worse this cycle. We're, we're just starting to see the symptoms of that illness in terms of the both both parties in the Congress, but it will be another order of magnitude larger in terms of how bad it is in 2020. And I can't encourage you enough to put me out of business and other people like me for the 2020 cycle. Uh, so she, uh, one, two, three. Thank you, Chris. Oh, all right. I'm doing this, and then if you can stand up and say it loudly, that way I won't have to repeat as much. Okay. I just want to say that 71% was only because there was no opposition to that issue. We're going to have opposition. Mm -hmm. yeah. All right, so, them spotting words. <laughs> <laughs> so you had a question, yes? Yes, clarification on vocabulary. We hear reapportionment and redistricting. Mm -hmm. And could you define, are they the same? Are they different? So okay, so this is, this, is a very good, this is a very good basic question so that you should all know this. Okay, every 10 years they have a census. The next census is in 2020. When they count, this is gonna count everybody in the United States. When, <laughs> all right, goal is, goal is to count everybody in the United States. So I understand her cynicism. Oh, and total side note, the, the census director just resigned. This is not good for all of us, and we should pay attention to what. So this is the other thing is we need to not just worry about redistricting or reapportionment. We need to worry about uh, we need to worry about the census. But that is a topic for another day. And perhaps you should lead that discussion. All right, so every 10 years you have a census, theoretically, you get you count all of the people, and then they do what's called reapportionment. And reapportionment is when they say, okay, you had 18 seats, now you're going to have 17 seats. Right? Or you had 19, now you have 18. It, it's, it has to do with that, is that um, that's reapportionment. You get X number of congressional districts. Redistricting is the drawing of the district lines. Yes. Oh, I forgot this guy, and I've, I've forgotten you over and over again. Okay, please. Reapportionment is based on one person, one vote rule. very well. So what she said is, it's reapportionment is based on one person, one vote, which even that doesn't work well. We should all be working to have a good census, and since I was extra neglectful of you. Stand up and tell us your question. Oh, no, it's the, I'm out, so I don't stand up. Oh. Um, no, so my question is, how many states are gerrymandered? <laughs> 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 All right, fine. 
how many states are gerrymandered, and uh, how many efforts are going on to redo it in other states? Okay, so so many, many states, and I don't have it off the top of my head. Chris, do you, uh, uh, let me finish what I was going to say. So many, many states have the state legislature draw the district lines. If the state legislature draws the district lines, sometimes they're really, truly dominated by one political party. So the most gerrymandered are the ones where both parties um, rule both houses. Nebraska, for example, would be a, a unicameral, so that, that, that model doesn't fit there. But the ones that are the most gerrymandered are the ones where the state legislature does it as a bill, and then it's approved by the governor, and they're all the same party. In 2011, um, we had a Republican House, a Republican Senate, and a Republican governor. Chris, you wanted to add something. Well, there's, I, I don't want to make this issue more complicated than it needs to be, um, but in terms of how many states, I would argue 49. Um, uh, the, the more generous uh, amount would be in the low 40s. Um, what you have, and maybe an outcome in Ohio, um, if the legislature tries to make a bargain of some sort, is in some states you have not geographic gerrymandering, so to speak, but you have what's a bipartisan gerrymander, where the two parties agree to work together to preserve their own incumbents. And so you have strange districts. So it's not, it's not you know, disproportionate to the vote. You know, if you may be a 50-50 state and half the districts are Republican and half are Democratic, but the districts look weird because, you know, this, again, member wants to have Timken in their district and that member wants to not have that person in their district. So, um, Iowa is the only state that really has an independent process, although that goes through the state legislature as well. There's a couple of states, Florida, California, Oregon, Washington, that have some proposals that went through the last cycle, um, but they've had some difficulty keeping uh, political processes out of that because they focused only on who were the people making the decision. What this proposal does is it focuses not only who decides, but what is the criteria on which they get to make their decisions. And that is a unique uh, aspect to this proposal. So you have a question. I do. I understand the words that are up there. Can you give, can you, oh, okay. Can you guess as to what, <laughs> what Rosenberger's uh, reasoning that he thinks is legitimate for saying that they're apples and oranges. Okay, so this is, so, so the question is, you know, this quotation seems peculiar. Um, I think we need to get used to word salad, right? Um, <laughs> <laughs> you know where you're like, oh, oh, my friend here has an answer, please. Uh, one of our Democratic state senators says that every senator in Ohio dreams of being in Congress someday. That's why it's apples and oranges. Okay, let's try this. All right, so um, this, is, this is what I would say. It's nonsense. It is absolute nonsense. Right, and we no, agree with that. It's total nonsense. That you want to have fair elections in both the state house, the Ohio House and the Ohio Senate, and you want to have fair elections when it comes to Congress, right? right. So in both places, you actually want to have fair elections. To have fair elections, you need to have fair districts. This is complete nonsense. But what's his, and I agree with you, and everyone here would, but what is the, what's, the, what's his reasoning? What's his argument that we're, we would come up against? So, so this is one of the things that happens, is when we think about the state legislature, the folks that put um, state legislative redistricting reform on the ballot for us, they're term limited out. So yes, they may do some musical chairs, and they mo there might be some of that, uh, um, but, but at the end of the day, they're only focusing on Ohio. For many people, you know, if they're having a national, national perspective, it would be like Ohio saying, we're gonna disarm. We are going to disarm, but you know those Democratic states are still going to gerrymander. And so there's a worry about how this will affect the, 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 the makeup of Congress as a whole. If all these different states try to start to do this 
in a fairer fashion, especially if, if the perception is it's only Republican states, which is not the case. There's active e efforts in both Maryland and Illinois uh, that I can think of off the top of my head. But it really could change the makeup of Congress. And so, so for a lot of folks that are uh, you know, leaders of the Republican Party, it can be worrisome. The other thing that sometimes people say is, you know, it's a divestiture of state legislative authority. Yes. It's, I know, that's actually a uh, former uh, a former Senate President Keith Faber said that. It can be difficult to give up anything where you actually have the power, right? I mean, it's not that easy to say, okay, we're going to give this basically to this commission. Um, it's going to work better. The other thing to remember is these folks receive large contributions during the time period that they are actually drawing the maps. Right? Oh, oh, oh yeah. Basically, congressmen pay a little attention to them, and you know, maybe they give a little here, a little there. But that's the other thing that's, that, that in many ways, they have a lot of pressure from their members of Congress to keep things the way they are. Because you know what? We're talking about the only election they have to worry about is the primary in the system that we have right now. And so there's a lot of pressure on them to keep it the way that it is. Hello, my friend. I was just going to say, I think the question is, what, what are you going to come up? He just says it because he figures he can say it. And most <laughs> people aren't going to have substantive reasons to back that up. So just, you know. You, so there really is no reason. There's no is what we're saying. Right. That's a right. point. He's just saying it. You know, you don't have to. You'll wait to see what somebody tried to yeah. argue this substantively. Yeah. Probably won't make sense. Okay. And Mary Annie, what do you have to say? This is a bit anticipatory, but I think probably <laughs> parts of the proposal there are differences that need to be taken into. I'm sorry. That that in the proposal, I have learned that there are differences that need to be taken into consideration when doing state lines versus congressional lines, and I think those are written into the proposal. But I just wanted to mention it because people might be confused after this discussion. Oh, I didn't know we'd even gotten into the discussion of what's actually in the proposal. But we will. <laughs> no, we haven't. We oh, haven't, but I've, but I've seen the so, spiel. So the thing, the thing about this that is important is, you know, fair districts, fair elections, Congress, Ohio House, Ohio Senate, it's exactly the same thing. But to get fair congressional districts, you do in fact have to focus on slightly build, bigger building blocks, which we'll, we will get into. It's the whole idea is that if you focus on keeping a city together when it comes to state legislature, there are 99 districts, right? Mm -hmm. Keeping that community together with 99 districts, it, it, it just, you know, it's just easier if you're using those smaller building blocks. So we are talking about using the larger building blocks of counties. Now we had counties when we were in the Northwest Territory. And it is a good way to understand communities. We can have a whole conversation about community representation. One of the things that Chris was talking about is in California, um, they um, have rules that basically they go into they do public hearings and people talk about their communities of interest. I don't know about you, but the whole idea of community interest, I don't know, blonde Lutherans that have, are of a certain age, like what does, you know, like what, what does it, you know, what does that actually mean? But the county is a really understandable way of keeping our communities together. Um, so, let's do this. We have hit 10, 1025. I wanted to give you guys a little bit of a break before we got into the proposal. What would you like to highlight, Susan? Do you have coffee here? <laughs> do you need caffeination? Because it's been way too boring. <laughs> All right, so get yourself some coffee, visit with your neighbors. Um, we're going to come back and we're going to actually talk about the proposal. It, um, take five. Um, 
We just kept at it. And when I say we, I mean the League of Women Voters, Common Cause, but really the League. The League of Women Voters was in the trenches in 1981. Yay. I was kind of busy with other things. And that high, whole idea of wanting to actually you know, have these fair districts has been this long, long road. So by the time we got to 2014, I consider it kind of like the mosquito principle. At some point, you are so darn irritating, they will do anything to get you to go away. Um, the other thing that happened at basically the same time is that the Speaker of the Ohio House was term limited out, a guy named Bill Batchelder. He was on his way out, and this was an opportunity for legacy building. You also um, had, had Vern Sykes, who's from Akron area, um, who was term limited out. He's back actually again, because you can do that, but he was term limited out. He had a long history of working on redistricting reforms since the 90s. And you had a guy named um, Matt Huffman, who was also term limited out. So there were these people that were like, oh, it's legacy building. Or maybe they were thinking about statewide office. Who knows? But for whatever reason, after long conversations, there was this thing called the Constitutional Modernization Commission. <coughs> They started talking about redistricting reform in July of 2013. So there were these ongoing, long conversations about redistricting reform beyond the other state legislative stuff. And together, um, Matt Huffman and Vern Sykes worked, worked to come up with a proposal that both sides could like. And that is actually why it was put on by the state legislature. And in fact, when we think about it, if in fact you put something on that's supported by Republicans, supported by Democrats, then in fact, it's going to have good support. It's, you, know, you know, you've got both the Democrats and the Republicans. There might be some people who poo-poo it. It's not you know, dramatic enough, or it's a compromise. It's kind of messy. But at the end of the day, it passed by 71%. Now, the question is, why did it only focus on state legislature? Well, that's because we were able to get state legislature. And part of that had to do with, there was, a, there was a situation in Arizona. Arizona has an independent redistricting commission to draw the district lines. The state legislature of Arizona really got annoyed by them. Because of course they were creating these really fair districts and they didn't actually like it. So what they did is, first of all, um, was it Jan Brewer? Yes. Yeah. So she tried to, basically she tried to get rid of the head of the redistricting commission that of course didn't work. And finally the legislature says, I say we sue them. And what they did is they claim because the US Constitution says that the congressional maps will be made by the legislature, they sued and said, it, ha it has to be us, we're the legislature. On the other hand, what they're talking about is a legislative body, the voters of the, of the state established the redistricting commission, and so when the Supreme Court heard this case in 2000, they heard it in 14, in 2015, they, in July 15, they finally made a decision and announced it saying that yes, in fact, you can have a redistricting reform commission. You can have one that actually does, does this work rather than the state legislature. So now this was a pretty um, easy excuse, right? It was an easy excuse not to include Congress, because, of course, a guy named John Boehner was saying, no, we really don't want to include Congress. No Congress, no Congress. So um, I think I highlighted why it's a lot harder to actually move congressional redistricting reform. I included this picture because, you know, in many ways, it's like you think you've come so far, but you haven't even left the parking lot. You know, you think, okay, so why is it so hard to actually move congressional redistricting reform? Um, and, and it really is a good question. If, in fact, you can get that kind of support, why do we actually have to do a citizen's initiative? Why do we actually have to take it to the people? But what do we want? We want fair elections. We want fair elections. And so we, we cannot separate that from fair districts. And so the Fair Districts Equal Fair Elections Coalition is all about, like, what do we want? We want fair districts. We want a bipartisan commission. We do not want one party drawing maps. We also want to have good rules. We want rules that keep counties together, good big building blocks that keep our communities together. We want compactness. We want to honor minority rights. We want transparency. And I think when we think about, well, what is, what is the thing that just makes you the craziest? Yes, rigging these for partisan advantage. 
but doing it in a sneaky way where we can't even influence the process is beyond irritating. So this includes good transparency features. Now, um, Marianne was saying there are some differences. The difference between issue one of 2015, building blocks are bigger. So there are counties. So think of a Duplo blocks versus Lego blocks. So if somebody says, oh, I hear this is completely different. Uh, no. There are 16 right now congressional districts. So think Duplo blocks versus little like, tiny Legos for 99, 99 Ohio House districts or 33 Ohio Senate districts. What else is different? All right, so issue one of 2015 was a compromise. And it was complicated. So I always love that people are like, in 2012, it was so complicated. Did anybody actually read the language? Oh, yeah, the, it, uh, it was extremely complicated. Now, one of the first rules of a citizen's initiative is you want to do it as simple as possible. So the language is stripped down to be as simple as possible. There's a prohibition on drawing districts to favor or disfavor one political party over the other as a whole, for the whole map. And the other difference is we do not have their tiebreaker. So what was their tiebreaker in issue one of 2015? Basically it said if you can't actually get minority votes, meaning the minority party votes, well that's okay. You can actually draw, uh, just as long as you have half of them, it just needs to be a four year map and then you'll go back and you'll do it again and create a six year map. Huh? Okay, so you can see why we didn't include it, right? Okay, this means that, okay, the state legislature, those district lines, uh, we, have, we have seven people. There's the auditor, governor, secretary of state. Then you have two members of, of the Ohio House, one a D, one an R. You have two members of the Ohio Senate, one a D, one an R. You could have a circumstance where there are only two Democrats, right? So, so to get a 10-year map, you need two votes of the Democrats. But it, it created a situation where if you couldn't get those Democrats on board, and we don't know, things could be completely different, but it just, you know, theoretically, if you couldn't get those two on board, you could draw with, with five people or four people, but you'd only have a short-term map. Now, can you imagine wanting to put that into the Constitution. Now, it was a good compromise. It got the job done. We can put tons and tons of pressure on them when they're doing the map making. But when it comes to Congress, the stakes are so high that what you need is this from the court. You do it, it's your constitutional duty. If you don't do it, just get back in that room and do it. You know, they can't have elections without those districts. The courts will be like this doesn't mean the courts will draw the district lines, but the courts can in fact force them to do it. Now we in the state have um, a budget process <laughs> in which we just have a deadline. And guess what? Some Democrats are in charge, Republicans are sometimes in charge, sometimes the houses are split, and yet they still come up with a budget by the deadline because it's constitutionally required. Question. What did you call that clause again? The tiebreaker? The tiebreaker? Did you call that? Did it have some other Oh, thing? Lord. This is the problem with talking too much. So she was asking about the tiebreaker. Does that, you know, I, I just, you know, four years, four year, six year tiebreaker. Gotcha. So I what just, we know from oh, history, and, and I, I will try to remember. The, from what we know from history with the tiebreakers is when there's a tiebreaker, a lot of times they just take their chances, right? You know, it's very tempting to say, you know, we'll just do, just for a couple election cycles, we'll do districts that we really, really like. No, no tiebreaker. Also, it's really complicated, right? So if you include it in a citizen's initiative, do, you, do anybody remember the really crazy long language in 12? Yes. yes. So we, if that's going to happen to us again, we want super short language, right? Mm -hmm. That's very simple. Yes. So the differences uh, that are here are, have to do with, hey, we really want to have uh, we want to mitigate gerrymandering by keeping counties together, so that's one. And the other thing is we wanted to simplify it so that it was super easy to read. Mm -hmm. And finally, we got rid of the tiebreaker because it was nonsense. So I have a question about the talking points, which I know you quite Ooh, I, Who here does not have their talking points? Okay, so th there are talking points on the table in the back if you want to grab talking points because our final exercise is going to be using the talking points. 
So the thing, the thing that I find um, could be really useful to us is explaining to people who are in a gerrymander district whose representative is the same party as them and has the same as them, why their representatives are still not actually accountable to them. Because we have, we have this great point that if things are gerrymandered, then representatives are not accountable to the people in their own district. So can you just explain that a little more thoroughly? Okay. If you have manipulated districts for partisan advantage, you are warping the elections because you are creating a situation where there are more Republicans or more Democrats in a district. By warping the election, right, you warp, warp the election, you don't have, you basically, you make it so it's very easy to keep those incumbents. You have Democratic districts, they're safe for Democrats. Your Republican districts, they're safe for Republicans. And at the end of the day, gerrymandering cements those incumbents. Because as long as they can get through that primary, so you see the other problem, right? As long as they can get through that primary, they are going to win that general election. And so why, why, do we, you know, why do we think about, like, I always say, fair districts, fair elections. But the other way to think about this is you manipulate the districts, you manipulate the election, you manipulate the policy, and you are likely to get hyper-partisan people of both political parties down in D.C., right? And it's very hard to get along. And if they don't have to worry about people that are general election voters, they're only going to worry about their party and they're going to worry about money, right? Party and money. And so they will not be truly accountable to just kind of general election, what you might think of as the average constituents. Does that explain it? Yes, so that if you go and talk to them, they're going to ignore you because you are one vote that doesn't matter, even if you're on the same side. So, so, so I don't know if you heard that. What we all feel is it doesn't matter. You are a voter, you are a constituent. In the system that we have, it just doesn't matter. And, and that in fact, our elected officials don't have to listen to us. When we think about what we're talking, taking on, and I know we can all get a little bit like, oh my gosh, this is complicated, how is this all gonna work? But when we think about what we're taking on, we are taking on improving representational democracy. Because we deserve to have an actual democracy. We deserve to have elected officials who actually listen to us. And on that note. So, um, I, I think what I was thinking about when you asked that question is, I think what I've observed most recently in Congress is that um, without compromise, without working for the common good and the betterment of the country, what happens is our elected officials stonewall and look out for the interests of their donors only. And I think when I've had conversations with people on both parties, uh, they're frustrated that, that what happens is we get into Congress and nothing happens. And so you look at guys like Portman and Joyce talking about the opioid crisis in Ohio, and not being able to get anything done to, for the betterment of the opioid crisis in Ohio and uh, nationwide because no one will compromise. And so they're not accountable for, for making any headway on that because they're safe in their election. How many of you have thought to yourself, I would really like to talk to somebody who thinks differently than I do? I would really like to get together with all sorts of people. And this is the perfect issue for that. This is one of those issues that Democrats, Republicans, Independents can come together and say, Let, you know, there are lots of things we're divided on right now, but one of the things we can all agree on is we deserve to have actual elections. We deserve to actually be a part of government because we, the people, are part of government and gerrymandering actually violates the will of the people. Yes. We, oh, she says, we are the government. Hello. Hi. Uh, do you know of certain groups or places where that is possible or there's already, you know, there's already a platform for those meetings? Because I would love to just be able to kind of plug and be like, hey, let's talk. But I, I don't know where to do that. So it is a tremendous challenge, isn't it, to find places where we can get together and not, you know, hate on one another. <laughs> right? I mean, and to, yeah. to really listen. So one of the things that I'm really excited about is this does provide an opportunity, but every community is different. So one of the things I would encourage you to do is to, to talk with one another 
about what are places where you could actually do this to actually get as many people that are different from you. Um, I do this thing where I, I, um, I, I go and I bother my neighbors. <laughs> and I, I hold regular, like, kind of, uh, well, some might call them parties. I'm, I'm a big yeah, fan yeah. of um, um, add, adding, adding a little something, something to nosh on, a little bit something to drink. And you can start to have really good conversations about what it is that you want and what you're worried about. You do have to let go, I, I mean, both sides have to let go of some stuff. And what I think of is stupid talking points. You need to talk to one another. I gave you guys talking points, but there, there, is, there is that thing of like, we need to lose, we need those, so we understand the situation, but you also need to really have human conversation and really connect. And I think what you're talking about is really important. There, uh, Catherine, do you want to stand up and introduce yourself? Yes, please. Um, and what am I to say when I introduce well, you? <laughs> <laughs> so this is what I was I, I'm very dutiful. She says, stand up. <laughs> <laughs> to coordinate Cuyahoga County and, and for the Fair Districts Equal Fair Election campaign. And so when I, one of the things that is important is that you will be able to pick up petitions and drop off petitions at the League of Women Voters uh, office. Um, and it's important if you, after this, um, touch base with her, get her information, and all this stuff will also be online and it will be in your, in your folder, but it can be really helpful to have a local contact. <clears throat> Anybody who here who is from the League of Women Voters of Greater Cleveland, please stand up. All right, so any of these wonderful people, any of these wonderful people, it is worth talking to them having a conversation about, well, how do you take this so that you can engage people all over the place? And I think we're doing many more conversations than we used to. Yes, hello, my friend, the social historian. Actually, I wanted to say something. <laughs> Never mind. Sorry. <laughs> Catherine, Catherine wanted to say something, and I talked too much. No, that's not all right. Um, the, the point being, when petition time comes, which is, you know, why we're all here, is ultimately we want to go out and get people to sign the petitions. Um, there will be numerous avenues for you to find a petition, get it in your hands, and go out and get signatures. There will be training, etc. Among the groups who will be doing this, um, we find prominently, but not uh, solely, uh, the League of Women Voters. So one way to be assured that you'll get all sorts of information about how exactly to pick up petitions and how exactly to get trained to do that is to join the League yeah. of Women Voters. And then you will get the information. The other way is to write down C. LaCroix, C-L-A-C-R-O-I-X, 55 at gmail.com and say hi, here is my name, here is my contact information, please include me on your roster of volunteers for Cuyahoga County. So that's all I wanted to say. So if you want to join the league, you can go to our website at lwvgreatercleveland.org and just hit the join button and I think it'll be I just want to say that I want to give also to acknowledge the work of NOVA that does incredible work on both voter registration and the lead and the lead, you know, back in this effort. All right, also, wait, let me just say one thing. In terms of what the woman said over there, I think which is really important to talk to other people, I think we need your help to go outside of Cuyahoga County, because that's not going to be the challenge as much as other places in other parts of the state, and some of us might be willing to spend the time to go elsewhere to talk to them. So if you can, in your position, with going around the state, could connect us, some of us might be willing to go. It's not so important in Cuyahoga County. Yes, we can get the signature. It's touching base with other parts of the state <laughs> that really we feel that they get far more representational than the densely packed Cuyahoga County. So that's a service you can hear. Anybody here. from Northeast Ohio uh, voter advocates, please stand up. <laughs> Hi, I think
think the last point about how our current process yields these very polarized uh, elected officials is one of the most critical points of this, but it's not clear to me how the proposal actually uh, addresses creating competitive districts. Okay, so the question is, wait a second, how does the proposal actually create competitive districts? Okay, so have you ever heard the saying, the eighth that made Ohio great? Okay, it's an, old, it's an old saying, but it has to do with the fact that we have all of these cities all over Ohio. And because we have all these cities all over Ohio, when we think about compactness, if you actually have compactness, because there's cities that are surrounded by more rural areas, you actually create more competitive elections just naturally by keeping communities as much as possible together. Chris, do you want to add something about that? Um, I guess. Uh, <laughs> I, I think it'd be helpful for us to get into the, the contents of the proposal itself, but uh, at least in Ohio, uh, because we have large, medium, and smaller cities distributed throughout the state for the most part, uh, when you have a whole county, you have an urban core, you have suburbs, you may have a little bit of exurbs, and those tend to be much more competitive districts. Uh, in states like Illinois that have one big anchor like Chicago, this proposal, at least the way it's written, may not be perfect for them. But the concept of the proposal would work in any state. Um, it's, it's that you use political subdivisions to build your districts uh, because we don't, generally speaking, yes, more Democrats tend to live in cities and more Republicans tend to live in rural areas. But we don't pick what street we live on and say, well, I want to live on Democrat Street or I want to live on Republican <laughs> Street. Um, we're, we're, we're more like that than we've been in the past. But when you use whole government subdivisions, you tend to have um, not only better partisan outcomes for these districts, but the people who live in those subdivisions can say, that's my congressperson. That's my one congressperson from Cleveland or that's my congressperson from Parma. And that makes it a lot easier to get that congressperson's attention because they know that that's their constituency and they have to be responsive. We have four congress districts, congressional districts in Cuyahoga County. Without commenting on any of the individuals, I would argue that we have maybe one person out of the four that interprets that they are from Cuyahoga County. That's problematic. And other counties, uh, Summit County immediately, you know, Akron's home county, also has the exact same problem. I, I, I believe they would say none of the, they don't believe any of the four people that represent, represent their county have Akron's interests at heart. So um, did, does that address what you so, want to? Absolutely, <laughs> so one, there's that idea of, hey, keeping communities whole is, a, is a, a very important value, but competition is also an important value. It is not explicitly stated, but in fact, we will have more competitive elections just based on that. But most importantly, let's suppose we have some districts that are not going to be competitive, just the way that we live. At the end of the day, knowing that you live in a county and that is your rep has real meaning, and it's much easier to get in touch with that person. So I'm, you know, for now I'm Franklin County, and we have three different ones, and we're all divided. Yes, no, my friend. How do you explain that to say your oh, to your um, hyper Republican who likes that their representative? crosses into hyper-Republican suburbs because they don't want to be lumped in with an urban core. So the, one of the ways that you can talk about this is all of, all of us can agree that you actually want to have competitive elections. Um, a competitive, competitiveness is a core value for Republicans. So it, you know a competition of you know a competition of ideas. You know, like for example, I really like my rep, but that doesn't mean it's fair that that he just gets to slide along, not having participated in a real election. Wouldn't you rather have a real election? And is and the other thing I think is we we have conversations about this. Some folks are not going to buy into it easily. They're just not. No, it's to look for the people who will and are open to the idea that we, we deserve a true representative democracy. And we deserve not to have a hand on the scale making it so that we don't actually have real elections when it comes time for November. Does that help you? I think 
based on the most recent election, it's going to be much more effective to talk to people who feel like they're not being listened to mm -hmm. than to appeal to some abstract notion of fairness. Because I don't know that a lot of people buy into fairness anymore. Okay. What they want is somebody to listen to them and their particular concerns. Okay, so how about this pitch? Do you want fair elections? Do you want your members of Congress to listen to you? Come sign this petition. Oh, the other thing that I found, I, I did you know, the first thousand signatures, I did a bunch of them, um, and one of the things that I found that worked the best was, I bet you haven't signed this yet. <laughs> you know, like just assume support. I bet you haven't signed this yet, assume support. Um, and, wow, so many questions. Was there somebody over here before I move over? Yes. I've been trying to think of this strategically, and I'm thinking if you're. I've been trying to think of this strategically, and I think if you live in a democratic area, you might want to target Republicans because they probably feel unheard. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Because I know, as a Democrat in a Republican district, I certainly feel unheard. But I like your. Um, I'm, you know, you should sign this now. <laughs> Most of, there are a lot of people who will sign any petition because they think the voters ought to have a voice. Right. Absolutely. There is a beauty in direct democracy, isn't it? So um, there's a gentleman over here and a lady over here and a lady there. Up to you, Mike. You pick. <laughs> oh, no. You do it. You're doing such a nice okay, job. Okay. So on, all the way on this side, and then we're going to flip over. Uh, so the lady right here. Hello, my friends. If we're enthusiastic and want to go out and do petitions, is there going to be a legal advisor telling you where you can and can't? For instance, I live in a very lovely condo community, and they have their rules that you can't put up political signs and you can't do petitioning. And yet I know there are all these people in there who would sign it. All right, so, so there is actually going to be a peti petition trainings. The Legal and the Voters of Cl Greater Cleveland participated in trainings, so they're going to go over the legal things. So basic rules of thumb, um, public locations, if it's a public area, you can definitely use it, but it is always a good idea to actually check in. So let's suppose you go into the parking lot of the DMV. <laughs> well, it's a public yeah. location. People are leaving. They probably just said, you know, you know, they probably just updated. They just changed their voter, you know, their where they live. It's a perfect time to actually get them, right? Um, well, you want to go in and say, hey, you know, I'm Catherine. I'm here. I'm going to collect some signatures. Some of them will be super nice. Some of them will be like, oh no. And it's all, you know, what I would say is, it is not worth having a fight about it, or because you don't want to be the person that's causing a hassle. Yeah, I mean, um, and then other times, if, if we find that in fact we're really having trouble in public locations, you know, we'll do what we can to help. Uh, we, we have lawyers standing by to help. Um, so the other, the other thing to think about is um, we have First Amendment rights, meaning you can knock on anyone's door and talk to them. It's one of the things that, in fact, we, it's an awkward thing to necessarily do that, but we do have the right to actually knock on people's doors. Um, and so that could be a way to organize your community. The other thing is, um, do you have like a, a, like a community space in your, in your condo? It's prohibited from using for political purposes. Oh, that's interesting. This, uh, so I wouldn't consider this like a Democrat or Republican thing, but I can understand what you're talking about. Yeah. So all I'm saying, if there was, if I knew my rights, if I had a lawyer who would say, no, you know, you can or can't, so when I go into the department, of, let's say the motor vehicle department, and they say, no, you're not allowed, I can say, aha, yes, but I am, because here's and the here's chapter the and verse. Right. Right. All right, we will make sure that folks have that kind of information. Um, this is the Speakers Bureau training. Um, so so that is another, that's another training, and it is also something where, that just like this, there'll be a webinar, and there'll also be information that you could get, like a PowerPoint, and that, and that kind of handouts. We're, we're going to do this. Um, we'll have it on the League of Women Voters website. We'll have it on our Facebook page. You know, so we're not at the petition training point right now and the strategies for petitions. Uh, right now, we're just covering basic why, why do we want this and, uh, and possibly what the time frame is. Could we get to what it is? What it is? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 You know, All right, can, can uh, I just yeah. ask about the recent ruling by Mike DeWine on the petition language, how that affects, you know, how this is going to affect the petition? Right? Did the signatures yeah. already 
collected are those? Okay, so this, this is what we're going to do. Um, it is, and right now it is 11.07. I want to get you guys out of here by 11.30. What we're going to do is we're going to go quickly over the proposal. I think we talked about the rules. Um, this is something that you can get back again. We're going to go through that, then we're going to move on to petitions um, and answer your questions about that, as long as that works for everybody here. Oh, and then I'll stay afterwards if you have a bunch of questions. So, like, if you're like, oh, my Lord, okay, I am the person that has 10 questions. She's never going to get to them. Stay afterwards, and I'll visit with you then. Okay, so we talked about the rules, that idea of keeping communities together, um, that old idea of openness and transparency, the prohibition on gerrymandering, that you can't draw a, a district map that favors or disfavors one political party or one candidate. Um, who's on the Ohio Redistricting Commissioner? Commission. Governor, Auditor, Secretary of State, Two members of the Ohio House, two members of the Ohio Senate. One member of the Ohio House is a Democrat, one member of the Ohio House is a Republican, and one member of the Ohio Senate is a Democrat, one member of the House is a Republican. Okay, so, as you, as you think about this, when I say uh, Republicans and Democrats, those are the two major parties right now. We do not know if the Whigs will come back. <laughs> so what it does say in the actual proposal is major party, minor party. All right, I know you're all excited about getting to the petitions. Okay, so the process for doing a citizen initiative, or what we call direct democracy, is a little bit labor intensive. Um, so uh, as you look at this, you think more than 305,000 signatures valid are going to be necessary, which means you kind of want to double that to go to like 600,000 signatures. Um, the first thing that you do is you collect a thousand signatures and you submit the proposal and the summary to the Attorney General. So um, we submitted the proposal to the Attorney General at the end of April um, and he came back and he said, this was not this past Thursday but the one before, he said, um, you know, it, you, you are missing two things. Now this, this happens, um, we all know when it comes to a summary you know, well, it's a summary. You're going to leave stuff out, right? <laughs> so so it, he came back and said, hey, it's important that people understand that the Ohio Redistricting Commission is reconstituted if, a, if, if the, the courts declare a map invalid. So that's something that we just say, you know, yes, you have the Constitutional Modernization. Well, I'm sorry. Yes, you have the Redistricting Commission to draw the district lines, but they're going to have to come back and redo a map if the courts have a problem with it. Then it also says that the court that actually addresses this is the Ohio Supreme Court. And, and so those are the two things that were added. So then last Friday, we did this total scramble because it, it came out, you know, thir Thursday evening, we did this whole total scramble to try to figure out the best way to do the summary. Um, our lawyer um, had discussions with the Attorney General staff because one of the things that we got in the letter is, this, you know, this thing, like, there are two things you need to change, but there might be more. Oh. And, yeah. that's how they it. That's how it started. And, and so, that's what it is. so we were like, um, okay, can you tell us what those other things are? If you don't include them in the letter, what are the other things? Um, they did not tell us any other things, so we went ahead, added the information to the summary, and then quickly, over the course of four days, collected more than 3,000 signatures. They were then submitted on Wednesday to the Attorney General again. The Attorney General will have 10 business days. From there, it will go to the ballot board, which is headed by the Secretary of State, um, and that's an additional 10 days. So we are likely to start, as long as things go smoothly, we're likely to begin actual collection in three weeks. So yes, these are the kinds of things that happen as you're going along. Um, but we will begin in three weeks, and that's what the, their, the goal that we have, and that's what we're going to assume. What we have done is identify, mostly only in 20 counties, what we call um, staging locations, where you can pick up and drop off petitions, um, and also get a little extra training, or if you have a bunch of questions. Um, this will also be a place where you can, you can practice a few of your talking points that I handed out, because that'll, that'll pop up, right? You're going to want to kind of practice some of your talking points. Um, and then what happens from there is all of those petitions go to Common Cause Ohio, our, our office downtown in Columbus, so we'll take those petitions. We will then copy them, scan them, 
Then we'll go through a period with where um, we will validate how many of the you know how many of the folks are actual voters. So for for any of you who's like, you know, I um, I really uh, like to do a lot of different things, but talking to people I don't know about something that's complicated does not for me. There will be data entry kinds of things that we will need actual help with. Um, once we basically get all those things together, they will go into an area where it's safe from fire, because those petitions are like gold, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Now, once we get enough signatures, we will submit them. Now, 2017, the deadline is July 5th of this year. Wow. OK, so what I'm telling you is, unless something miraculous happens, we're talking about 2018. But that means that we can use 17 to collect signatures, all of the good weather of 17 as we're going into the summer, into the fall, all the different festivals, all the different places that we can actually collect signatures. Um, and having a robust, what I think of as a citizen army, like all of us out there promoting good representational democracy and fair elections, we are going to be much more successful if we have a really concentrated effort of actually engaging voters and signing. Because I, I'm going to tell you this, just not to depress you, but I, I think we need to think about why is it that we are here today on a Saturday? 40% of citizen initiatives pass. That's in the past 25 years. Four zero. So what we need to do is obviously, you know, we're talking about money on TV and money on radio and all those kinds of things. But if we can spend our time making sure that we get as many endorsements as possible and as many people kind of engage as we're talking about them, then it becomes this, this ongoing conversation and we're so much more likely to be successful. Yes, hello my friend. So is the goal that we should be should we be calling our local library and saying, hey, can I set something up for a speaker thing for June of 17 because we're really actually looking at this July 5th date? Or is Fair Districts for Ohio realistically scrapping that and looking at November 18th? So we should be calling the library and saying, hey, I need a couple of dates over the summer. Or do we really need to push so, for June? So this is what I would say. If we act like, oh, this is going to be easy peasy, we don't need to rush, we're not going to get it done even if we have a deadline in 18. And I really think one of the things that, that makes good sense is to plot out, like what, where, just like you said, like, hey, let's do this in June. Let's do something in July. Let's do something in August. Because no one in the world is going to want to collect signatures in December, right? <laughs> no one is going to want to, like, or, 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 you know, try to think about January. What about March? So, so we, there should be urgency even if we're not able to get on the 17 ballot. The other thing that becomes more problematic, a number of us um, are going to be kind of busy in 2018. Yeah. So for some folks, there are candidates they care about. For some folks, they're doing debates or they're getting voter information out. But it is important to say 17 is the time to actually get as much done as we possibly can. I'm going to come back to you. Yes. If we get the 305,000 or 400,000, 500,000, mm -hmm. are we going to then um, submit them and try to get it on 2017? Oh, yes, absolutely. If we actually have an adequate supply, the goal is to actually get them in when we actually have them. So the goal is, you know, to, you know, big, big effort. Let's see how we can do this. Because as soon as we get it in, we can then be spending all of our time thinking about, well, how do you educate the public? How do we, we need to think about this as a long term educational campaign. Linda. My question is this. Once we succeed, which we will. Yes. Okay. <laughs> once, once we succeed, then it's the vote yes campaign. Yes. Okay. The vote yes campaign is going to need millions of dollars. Do yes. We, do we have a war, a war chest? Because you know what kind of opposition is out there. I have three checks, but we could use a lot more. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, so actually, we so the, the, what I would say is we do not have adequate resources at this point to have a robust, you know, twenty million dollar campaign, which is actually one possible recommendation. 
what, what I would say is we do have our eye on the prize, um, a focus on major donors. We have a campaign where we're looking at major donors. We're looking at, and, and also small donors. We're looking at national money. Um, so we do have a plan to get that money. Um, and we do have enough so that we, uh, we can keep going. And so the, the idea that somehow we need to like, oh Lord, we need two million right this very second, or we need 20 million right this second, like the lowest is like eight million, right? Which is a which is a lot, and so you need to kind of plan it out, and it it will come. How's that? <laughs> uh, there was a conference call about a month and a half ago. Mm -hmm. I think you were on it. Yes. Fair district, fair elections, and there was some talk about reaching out to the state house and to some Republicans mm -hmm. that uh, to try to avoid the uh, fight. And oh if, yes. If there was a way to find support um, across the aisle. And I never heard what happened. Okay, so uh, so what she was wondering about, of course, is you know this is this is going to go down in flames if we do not find a way to have this be bipartisan, nonpartisan. That it's all about fair districts, fair elections. Um, and so we've been in a process where we're reaching out to a bunch of Republicans, and you might think of like the, the logical ones that we're reaching out to, um, people like John Kasich. Um, John Houston, who's had a long history of supporting redistricting Thank reform. Bob Taft would be a good example. So we've been going through uh, conversations with people. Um, some people, I don't know, they're running for governor and they have other things to do. Um, <laughs> but but as, as we go through these, that's the other thing is if you know business people or, or somebody who you know is a prominent Republican, it's worth reaching out to them and talking to them about being part of this. So we do have what I'm calling the biz business leaders for, for uh, redistricting reform. Um, and they are uh, business owners that are promoting redistricting reform as being important for democracy. Like as we think about, if all of the kind of fights are highly this or that and extreme, then they aren't really focusing as much as they can on building communities. And for many business leaders, that is very important. The, the extremes are problematic for them as well. Oh, we also, if you're, if you're a, a social studies teacher, we also have a, a committee that social studies teachers for ending gerrymandering, so let me know. <laughs> Catherine? Yes. Oh, Chris has been super patient. Oh, that's oh, nice. okay. I have a I, Ooh, okay. So, uh, you know, I work on the government side in terms of consulting, but I also do campaigns. Um, I would say that at this point, um, why we while we would welcome some very nice person to give twenty million dollars or something on that order, that it's not quite in the interest of this campaign yet. As Catherine said, this needs to stay bipartisan at, at this point. And so in order for it to be bipartisan, that means that the people who are normally interested in politics are entities that are usually affiliated with the Democratic Party or the Republican Party. There are people on the Democratic side, especially because they're in the minority right now, that we could potentially get hundreds of thousands of dollars from. But if this becomes, at this stage of the game, a, a, a single party issue, it will lose. That is, in... in in my opinion, a large part of what happened in 2012, the Republican Party decided they were against it, and the Democratic Party decided they were for it. That's not a fight that either party will win. Secondly, yes, have it, we, we need enough money to keep this going and to get signatures and to have a credible threat that this will be on the ballot. Because 70% of voters did approve in 2015. But another potential outcome that could be very worthwhile is that the further we get along in this process, the more the legislature gets scared that it's going to happen. And they may choose to put forward an initiative that is their version. As long as it gets the outcome, who cares? <laughs> Whether it's the legislature or the League of Women Voters or Common Cause or whatever organization is the one that put it on the ballot, as long as it is a good proposal. So right now, the point we need to emphasize is giving as much leverage as possible to the nonpartisan groups to let them pressure the legislature as much as possible. Do their job. Yeah. So, so she's been very patient. Go for it. Um, okay, I was on that conference call too, and I asked about the strategy of which year is better. And you mentioned that we won't have all the competition for advertising if we do it in 17 that we would have in 18. Yes which I think is a good strategy. And along that line, 
I picture us going out to Fourth of July and Memorial Day parades. You can get thousands and thousands of signatures just going along the parade route. And I'd be willing to go to, to Podoc or wherever in some county with my best friend and we could get thousands on Fourth of July, get them in that night, get them to Columbus in time for the, the filing if we have that time frame. Do you have been patient too? Hi, I just want to introduce myself. I'm Karen Austin. I'm with the Women's March. So we are actually looking at promoting this. Um, we're looking at going on Facebook Live. We're looking at trainings. We're looking at how to do the training. And we have a mobilized community right now. So where you're thinking that, you know what, there's no way to do this, there's a way to do this. There really truly is. Because how many people did we get to DC? We had buses and buses from all over Ohio of people going to DC. Now granted, those are people who are Hillary supporters or Democratic supporters, uh, non-supporters of Trump, but at the same time, we have that mobilized base. So where you're kind of feeling, you know, I'm a little scared of this passing, I think there's a real shot of this passing. And uh, one of the things I would say, even though I'm, I'm making us be very aware of what is needed, that doesn't mean that I don't have my eye on the prize. We could, we could actually change democracy to make it real. <laughs> I know. <laughs> we are the leaders we've been waiting for. <laughs> Absolutely. So you mentioned that um, if the legislature feels like, hey, this is really going to pass, they may do something. I thought that I heard that there was currently in the legislature a bill um, to talk about redistricting, but it was different. Clearly different from this. So, um, so, do we have some talking points to differentiate between the two? Do we need to do that? How do we talk about that? So, this is the way I would talk about it. It is sponsored by one Ohio senator. It has had not a single hearing. And last time, they, they had introductions in both houses. They had one hearing where the sponsor gets up and says what's in the resolution. I would be very surprised if any I don't if anything came of that resolution. So what's the difference? The difference in it is that it leaves the map making with the state legislature. The right. state legislature that's dominated by one political party. Two thirds. Right. Uh, the other problem is it focuses on keeping cities and um, townships, municipalities together without keeping the counties together. So when you think about, you know, if you have little building blocks, you can imagine the shenanigans you can engage in. For example, you could go all the way across the, the, the lake. <laughs> Hello, you haven't, I haven't had a question yet, have you? No. I'm just curious uh, about this idea of the 4th of July, because the deadline's the 5th. Is that realistic? Why so one of the things I would like say that? is throughout this process, we will be, you know, putting these, you know, scanning these things, copying these things, um, seeing how many valid, and putting them into the boxes. And have any of you ever done a citizen initiative where you take all the boxes in? You literally are talking about a, like a semi. Like it becomes, a no, you know, boxes and boxes and boxes. But if you're doing the process as you, as you go, you're going to be much better prepared. Is it possible? I think we should have our eye on the prize. Why not? Why not? So the 4th of July is a Tuesday this year. So all the activities are going to be the weekend. Yes. So that yes. gives us time to get things for the fifth. So I like the way. July is a, is a Tuesday this year, so all activities will be on the weekend. So that gives us time to get lunches. There are people behind you that have not had an opportunity. I just want to put out there that Memorial Day weekend's coming up too. Yes. And so that's, you know, yeah. yeah. Will we have a petition? We may have the petitions. If we do, you know, that we can go ahead. And where would we get that? Okay, League of Women Voters of Greater Cleveland will have petitions. Your staging location in Cuyahoga County is the League of Women Voters of Greater Cleveland. It'll be on our website and our Facebook page. So the other thing about this is, you know, one location can be really hard. If you have an organization and a space and would like another location, just like I'm doing a training on the east side and west side, it, it may make sense to have other locations. So um, if you are, uh, you know, have a, a group that would like to do that, just let us know.
Um, I would like a little more information about uh, how the districts are going to be decided on. Uh, I'm concerned about the, the fact that we don't specify a specific like computer program to use. And there was something about uh, the counties can be divided by one line, but it just said line. It didn't specify a straight line. Couldn't that be a crazy line like we have now? OK, so there are different, they're different values that may knock up against one another. So one of the values is minimizing splits of counties, right? So minimizing, it's not clear. What does that mean exactly? Um, it, what is important is as much as possible trying to keep those counties whole. Um, the other thing to think well, about is... I understand, I understand the idea, but how, how, how does this uh, amendment specifically make that happen? That's what I don't understand. So that's the language. It, you minimize the splits. I think the thing that is important here is we needed to do this very simply. Also, you know, computers are fabulous. There's different, so there's Maptitude, there's District Builder. There, there are different, you know, GIS softwares that you can actually use. But what's important is having these, very, what we think of as rules that are fairly simple and straightforward that people can read. And at the end of the day, you know, um, computers are tools. You know, garbage in, garbage out, we used to say. It's the same idea. You know, um, the idea, we had, a, somebody had a question about <coughs> what compactness model we're planning to use. Um, for many of us, we're probably not even aware that there are multiple compactness models. Um, ROAR is one that we used in 2011 when we did this redistricting competition. It is true that there are not this level of detail in this proposal. Now, the other thing that is true is during 2021, when they're actually doing this map making, we will have the opportunity to put pressure on them, get information, do public records requests if we're not getting it. And I really do think winning is important, but what happens during 2021 and just being as engaged as we possibly can is going to be very important. Because you are absolutely right, the devil is in the details. So I just want to comment on what you said earlier about the urgency of getting this done in 2017. And right now, I think we should all be able to come away with a particular message that we can all put on our Facebook walls that say that in 21 days, unless there's some craziness that goes on, that the petitions will be able to move forward and we'll be able to collect petitions up until the deadline, which is July 5th. I mean, there were some indivisible groups who I think were probably well-meaning, but had the wrong information right. and said that there was gonna be a redirection of our, of our efforts and our momentum. And we certainly do not want there to be any confusion oh. as to what the target is right so, now. So the other thing is, no matter what, our target is this year for collecting those signatures. And we cannot lose momentum. We need to, like, the, this is a tremendous number of signatures. And the whole idea that, oh, don't worry, it'll be next year. No, we need to collect them now. We need, obviously, we need the petitions, but we need to collect them absolutely in 2017 and as rapidly as possible. I just have a comment here. The deadline is not July 5th because we're headed for 2018. It's any day here in 2017. Am I correct? No. So no, if you want to get okay, so if you if we want to get onto 2017 ballot, we need to get it in by July 5th of 2017. Yeah, but that's impossible, isn't it? Really? No. 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 That's what we're saying. So this is what I would say. It's impossible if we don't try. Okay. And, and more importantly, let's say we don't make it. There are benefits of 2018 as well, and no matter what, we need to get so this going. If we don't make it in 2017, we can still get signatures yeah. Yeah. after oh, yes. July 5th. Yes. That's oh, yeah, you just I want to be clear about. Right. So in other words, those signatures do not go bad. Okay. You know, they, don't, they don't go bad. It's not like it says this has to go into effect on the 2017 ballot. It will be either 17 or 18. The only thing that happens, this is the other reason to do a compressed amount of time is people move. And so having an, a vision of getting this done really quickly is important, not just to get on the ballot in 2017, but so that those signatures are valid. Like, so can we, oh. <laughs> I was just trying to bring it back to the Speaker's Bureau. Where, can we see the proposal? Yeah. Um, I haven't seen it. Oh, okay. Yeah. So, it's, it's, yeah. so this is what we're going to do because we have hit 11:30, and my guess is many of you are ready to go. 
Now, this is what I'm going to say to all of you. Um, we will have the proposal available in your little um, your Google folder so that you'll have that. It is also on the FairDistrictsOhio.org site. You also can also you can also find the summary. There. Let's see if I can. Oh, I don't have internet here. Um, you can also find the summary, the one that was handed into the uh, Attorney General, and you can also find what I think of as a, a normal kind of summary. All right, this lady had something she wanted to say. Yeah, well, I'm just curious we about not only the um, content for the Speakers Bureau, but how you know, just how it happens, how we get connected. Is it you know what is our role in that? Okay, so once you are all once you're all trained, you get your information. What I will do is the next time there is something in Cuyahoga County, I'll send an email out and I will ask whoever wants to come along to come along with me. And that gives an opportunity. You can either come and just watch, which is fine. You can come and you can do part of the presentation and see how that goes so that there's a little bit of a mentoring. And so there are folks like me that have done this for a long time that will be kind of a mentor. And then there's a point where you'll say, okay, I'm completely confident in this and I will go off to do this on my own. Mm -hmm. So that's the goal. So the next time we're doing something, you all will get an email that says, hey, we're doing this thing in Cuyahoga County. Would you like to come along? It's one of the reasons we, we are like obsessed with your zip codes. <laughs> we're like, we need, I, what about what? I need your name, your contact information, but your zip code is, is super important. Um, so that's how this model was supposed to work. Now, for some of you, you might have come and thought, okay, we're going to have a lot of training on how to give an actual presentation. We will also, on in that folder, we will have what, what I think of as like a five minute video of. of I think it's me and there's one with Carrie giving a presentation so that you can actually watch a presentation that you could give to the public. Um, for uh, others, you might want something that's short and sweet. I also encourage you know, folks to actually check out the talking points and, and, and to see how they come together. One of the things we do know from polling is not everything works with everybody. Right. I don't know if anybody, do you, anybody part of the Senate Bill 5 stuff? Where you like had a triangle and there were three things you say and that's it, and it was you know it was you know, it was just very simple. We will I think we're going to get better at this and I think we're going to figure out how better to communicate about this. But I think at the end of the day, talking gerrymandering with some people will work really well. But for most people, it's all about fair elections. It's all about hey, we want to have fair elections. All right, we have hit a point that anybody who wants to leave should leave. Anyone else who wants to stay for questions should stay for questions. And then please follow up with me. I think. Oh, there are 54 signature lines on each petition. But keep in mind, you will not have to, like, you don't have to do 54. Also, keep in mind, you're going to want more than one book, even if you're only going to get a few, because you're going to run into somebody from the rain county, or you just make sure you have one covered you mentioned Cuyahoga County, but you haven't mentioned anything on our community. Well, she's not. 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 She's not